Welcome inside episode 576 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains on our draft rankings continue to climb. We're all the way into the mid-20s in Pillsy. I like both of the guys on today's list. Yeah, we've got two defensively responsible centers. And from prospects to veterans, Ross, did you see Pierre Lebrun? New piece on Claude Giroux at The Athletic. I can assure you that there was a Hearst, Ontario reference, but we'll get into all that and more. This is the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day. Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Senators your first listen on this Wednesday, June 8th. We are free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube, where the best way to help us grow the show is to like the video by clicking the thumbs up right down there. You can subscribe to the channel and leave a comment as well. I want your most provocative Senators take today, and we'll get to those later in the week. But Pilsy, you mentioned it off the top. Claude Giroux, the center focus of Pierre Lebrun's most recent article with The Athletic. Are you more or less convinced that Giroux is coming home after reading it? Unfortunately, I got to say less convinced. And this is why, Ross, we talked about we want the Florida Panthers to win the cup. Get Claude Giroux his cup. He's happy. He's got a ring on his finger. Now just bring it on home and ride off into the sunset and carry this Ottawa Senators franchise to a spot where they can start contending for a cup. But as we know, the Florida Panthers lost the battle of Florida to the big brother, Tampa Bay lightning. And Claude Giroux is still without that ring on his finger. And from what Pierre Lebrun writes, it seems like that's his number one priority here. Yeah. Now the real curious thing, a guy with a young family that was also referenced in the article, he's got a uh, two and a half month old and a 10 month old at home. So really young. You got to think stability is at the forefront, which was one of our major selling points. You can go back and listen to that episode of Locked On Senders where we had our own sales pitch of how to bring Claude Giroux home. Of course, that was immediately after the Florida Panthers lost. But a part of me sees that and is like, okay, three-year contract makes sense, whether it's with Ottawa or elsewhere. Like That way, you can at least get your kids in school. All the things that are off ice that the average fan would never know or care about a player. Now, that to say... If he is as gung-ho as I need the best chance to win a cup all the time, does he, A, take a major discount to play in Florida to stay where he's now somewhat comfortable, 20 games, won the first round of the playoffs? It's clearly a contending team in the Florida Panthers. Or do we see a Marion Hosa-type scenario where he signs a one-year contract, whether it's in Florida or another contending team, and then he plays it year by year to see. Because this guy's already made, what, $60 million? I don't think he's struggling on the bottom line. Yeah, he's got some money in the bank, that's for sure. But when I didn't realize the kids were that young, Ross, that, that's interesting. Because I feel like if you're Claude Giroux, then you're saying this three-year window is my window that I can bounce around. Because it's not like kids are going to be enrolled in school uh, you know, have made like serious friendships or anything like that, be involved in uh, community sports or anything like that. Now, I'm not a parent, so I don't know the uh, all the implications that go on with uh, having a zero to three-year-old versus a three to a six-year-old and all that kind of stuff. But that's something that I thought maybe um, Claude and his wife were saying, hey, look, before the kids get of that age, let's try to get that cup for you. And uh, maybe you can bounce around and do those one-year deals. Take a big discount to stay in Florida because Florida's going to need him to take a discount if he's going to stay there. They're paying Keith Yandel $5.3 million to not play for them this year. Like, that's a big chunk of change. Bobrovsky's still making ten mil. Huberto, his contract's coming up soon. Like, They've got money allocated in other spots. So if Claude Drew wants to stay there, he's probably going to have to take a discount. And I don't know how successful a person can be chasing a cup. Like if you're just going to be like, okay, it didn't work in Florida. Let's try to go somewhere else. Like we've seen guys try to do it. Joe Thornton's a great example, although he's got a couple more years on Claude Drew. Um, it just, it doesn't always work out. 
Well, his two choices really were between Colorado and Florida, and he said, I only want to go to Florida. Yeah. And the other team uh, <laughs> swept two out of three rounds. On and is now final. in the Stanley Cup Finals, yes. yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's just the thing, though. I'm glad you brought up Joe Thornton, Claude Drew's teammate this yes. year yep. uh, with that. We saw Patrick Marlowe bounce around to 2,500 teams, it felt like. Uh, Pittsburgh, like Patrick Marlowe, Penguins jersey has to be one of the most rare in sports. But yeah. we, we've seen it so many times. Jerome McGinley, we talked about with Ian Mendez. There's so many examples of guys who go through this and not everybody gets the Ray Bork story where he goes from Boston to Colorado, wins a cup right away. It's just an amazing accomplishment. We're talking about it 20 years later, but not everybody gets that same yeah. story. It really isn't. So to me, the question is like, who are the Colorado avalanche of 2016, 17? Like to me, it's like New Jersey, Ottawa. Like these are the teams where they've already been bad for so long that they've accumulated all these assets. And now it's like, okay, now you need smart managerial skills, which the jury's out, whether they can have that. And if so, then those are the teams that if I'm Claude Drew, I'm like, okay, Florida's definitely a great choice. Like there's yep. nothing wrong. If he stays in Florida, if they can make the money work, it makes a lot of sense. But I'm not so convinced that if you go to name a contender, let's say Pittsburgh, an aging core, like, not that Drew would ever go to Pittsburgh being a Philly. Like, talk about one one way ticket to ruining your legacy yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in Philadelphia. But that to say, like, it's just you got to think two steps ahead. Just like Drew's made such a career out of doing on the ice with his high hockey IQ. It's not who's good now. It's who's going to be good during the length of your contract. So that's kind of my, my last saving grace. But LeBron said it in the article. He said, I don't think it's a crazy idea for Giroux to go to Ottawa. And here's the direct quote. Um, and, and shout out to Jack Richardson. I think he got a shout out in yesterday's show with the Dylan James, Nikita Zaitsev comparison. But here's the exact quote he clipped from uh, Pierre Lebrun's article. Giroux and his family are headed back to their off-season home in the Ottawa area. Hmm. There's been some chatter among Senators fans about the idea of Giroux landing there as a UFA to help the rebuilding Senators along. I actually think it isn't a crazy idea. But... Perhaps makes more sense in a few years instead of now. Drew wants to win a cup so bad right now. I get some uh, Hansel. He's so hot right now. Vibes out, out of that last line. But Pilsy, he's 34 right now. Like, what do you mean in a couple of years? Like, we're bringing in a 39-year-old Claude Drew? That's a whole different conversation. We're talking like Spets on the Leafs vibes with that. That's not what we're hoping for. We want a top six guy who can contribute now. And that's the thing, like, I think Ottawa should really try to sell to him that, like, you could be the missing piece that turns this team from, oh, I hope we can contend to the playoffs to we're now contending for the playoffs consistently. And you're the veteran guy, the hometown guy, the veteran guy that's going to finish out your career, creating a new legacy, helping build a new legacy in Ottawa. Personally, I think there could be a lot more value to that than just trying to catch lightning in a bottle and trying to land on the right team at the right time for the right money. They caught lightning in a storm, his Florida Panthers. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, the, the cats were uh, going for cover as they were getting rained and uh, lightning and thunder going on in that second round. So that's that's the thing that I would be trying to sell to Drew is don't try to catch that quick like you're just hoping everything works out yeah. come here and build something and make it work out here because i think 34 years old this is the time where he's still impactful enough but combined with all that experience and everything that he knows on and off the ice to help all the younger guys in ottawa that don't have that and i just think it would make perfect sense personally and obviously it's biased but i think things would work out better for him in ottawa than it would in florida Oh, I would absolutely love it. But again, lots to lots to still be decided here into this offseason, including some RFAs left to sign. We've got six coaching vacancies in the NHL right now, and you got to think those are all filled up by the time the NHL draft rolls around, which is officially less than a month away. It's June 8th. The draft is July 7th and 8th. Coming up right after the break, we'll tell you what our plan is for coverage on the way to the draft and then get back to our rankings with numbers 26 and 25. Pilsy, I believe you have a word from one of our favorite sponsors. Wait, before we move on, though, I want to yep. pose a question to you. Okay. From my understanding, there's only two options for Claude Giroux, Florida or Ottawa, right? Like, there's no mm. way he goes to the open market and chooses somewhere else, right? Mm. I could see it. Yeah? 
Yeah, I don't know who or where. Like, if he wants to really be Marion Hosey, he'd go to the Lightning. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, hey, Corey Perry could tell him all about that because uh, Corey Perry faced the Lightning twice in the finals, and then he's like, "Well, if you can't beat him, join him." So no doubt, it does make sense there. But yeah, that's just something I like. I, I think either he's going to go to Florida right away, like as soon as, uh, well, I mean, they could. Well, you'll see them have to trade. Probably Patrick Cornfist would be the guy that has to be on his way out. True. Yeah, they are going to have to, they're going to have to do something. But I think either he signs with Florida right away or hims and Hawes and is choosing between Florida and Ottawa. I just, I don't see him wanting to go a- anywhere else. So that's I, I would say probably it's like a 65% he's going back to Florida, 35% he's going to Ottawa. That's that's just a random uh, feeling that I have. Is It's somewhere around those lines. All right. Well, we'll find out sooner rather than later. In the meantime, we'll let everyone marinate on that. Let us know what you think. Is it more or less likely that we're going to see Claude Giroux in Ottawa now that his team failed to win the Stanley Cup? All right, Pills, you got a word here? Well, regardless of where uh, Claude Giroux goes, and if he stays in Ottawa, he's not going to have to worry about fixing his car up to make that road trip. But if he signs somewhere else, he's going to have to pack the family up, and he's going to want to make sure his moving vans, his car, everything is in good order. And the way to do that is to go to rockauto.com because they've got all the parts your car or truck will ever need. It's so hard to find the right parts at your local chain auto parts store because with shipping, with everything being down, the price of everything, it's impossible for them to have everything you need. But it's not impossible for Rock Auto. They're a family business. They've been doing it for 20 years. They know how to set themselves up for success. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer. We want to save you money, and the best way to do that is at rockauto.com. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to your auto parts needs. You need brake parts? You need tail lamps? You need motor oil? Or do you need new carpets? rockauto.com's got you covered. Go today to rockauto.com and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com. All right, Pilsy, a little bit of uh, magic there. If you're watching on YouTube, I disappeared for a second. Just had to get something uploaded that wasn't working. So we got it all fixed up to get to our draft rankings. But before we do that, just a a recap for those maybe who've been in and out during the offseason or who are starting to get into the draft content right now because we're less than a month away. Our plan, as we continue to count down two per day, we've already counted down from 64 to 27. And all of those draft profiles are available on demand on YouTube with just like 10 to 12 minute videos. And that way, if a prospect's name catches your attention, you can search them up quickly and get just that quick bonus content. Again, that's available on demand on Locked On Senators YouTube page. We've updated our rankings now with Scott Wheeler's final list, and we're going to continue moving the way up. And then as final lists come out, I believe Chris Peters is going to have his out soon. I hope so, at least, because his last one was just after Christmas, Pilsy, and he still has Slavkowski at 10th overall. We know (laughs) that. That has to go up. There's just no two ways about that. Speaking of Chris Peters, we're working on a time to get him on the show. We're working on getting Corey Pronman on the show. We're working on getting Scott Wheeler on the show. Uh, We're working on getting David St. Louis on the show. So we've got lots of draft coming up. Cam Robinson as well. Absolutely. Cam Robinson's going to help us out with our full first round mock draft, which is going to be a ton of fun. It's going to be a YouTube exclusive. It's going to be long. It's going to be in depth and it's going to be, well, 32 picks. And then we're going to do a few extra of the senators picks, trying to pinpoint some guys that the team could be most interested in. So that's the plan here coming forward. We're going to finish our draft rankings on Friday, June 24th, which still gives us a lot of time before the draft. And then on that Saturday, you can expect the draft mock draft to be posted on YouTube. And then following week, it's going to be all draft interviews. It's going to be a little bit of uh, podcast magic as I'm going to be out of town, but all of it will be pre recorded and getting you set for the NHL draft. Pillsy will be putting out locked on now, quick videos on draft night. So be sure to be locked on the Senators YouTube page. All right, Pillsy, all that administrative bureaucratic stuff out of the way. Now we can get back 
to our draft rankings. I really like both these kids. I don't know if I'm going below four stars. I might even go above them for a couple, but we should get back to it as we do. All right, coming in at number 26 on today's edition of the Locked On Senators Draft Rankings. Oh boy, he's big, he's sturdy, he's reliable from the Quebec raw power. It's Nathan Gaucher. Nathan Gaucher, as you mentioned, big. I've got him listed at six foot three, 207 pounds. He's a right shot centerman playing with the Quebec Remparts. And uh, Ross, I don't know about uh, a lot of the QMJHL jerseys. Like, I don't watch the Q a lot, but watching highlights, they, the graphic design team in that league needs <laughs> needs to get working on. Because the, the picture we have on YouTube, this one's not bad, but they have some Christmas jerseys that... I see what they're trying to do. They're trying to do the devil's uh, green and red design, but it just, it didn't play for me. So that's, that's one comment right off the bat is the cue. And we talked about the Gatineau uh, Olympic jerseys. Oh yeah. Not quite hitting right either. So let, let's get some work on the graphic design for the cue. That's the first thing Noted. I want to get off my chest here. Um, back to Nathan Gauthier here. 66 games played, 31 goals, 26 assists, good for 57 points. And he was the QMJHL best defensive forward in 2020-2021. So that, for a lot of these prospects, was their rookie year. But Nathan Gaucher was actually a 2019 draft pick. So he was able to play an extra year before that, uh, before COVID hit. So he's one of the lucky ones from that standpoint. And that award is called the Guy Carbono Award. So obviously pretty uh, prestigious there with a name like that. And he fits the bill. Now, his first year in the QMJHL, the offensive numbers were not there. And you see that a lot of guys. They take some time to get in. Even the second year when he won this award, it was still like, okay, he's, he's starting to figure it out at this level, just over, like at a point per game. But this year, I mean, you could say that the points were slightly less per game, but 31 goals. He finally figured out the offensive production. Now, Elite Prospects, though, says his shot selection isn't very good. So to score 31 goals when your shot selection isn't even very good, you wonder what kind of ceiling that could bring. The rankings are as follows. Bob McKenzie has him listed at 20th on his list. Corey Pronman has him at 23. Chris Peters has him at 28. Elite Prospects at 30. Scott Wheeler at 38. And Craig Button at 47. That's an average of 31, Pilsy. He's a right shot centerman. Great in the faceoff dot. Kills penalties. Stands in front of the net on the power play. Like this guy, I would say, is a jack of all trades, master of none type thing. Yeah, I think that's fair. And uh, when you say maybe the shot selection isn't the best, but still he's scoring 31 goals, I think that's because he's a guy, like you mentioned, he uses his size to plant himself in front of the net. And he's not someone that's going to rely on getting into uh, open spots in, in like the high slot and then right. getting a good wrist shot. He's going to be banging away garbage goals. He's going to be getting tips. He's going to be getting uh, rebounds that bounce off the goalie's pads and he outmuscles the defenseman to get to that loose puck. Like, that's the kind of things I see Gaucher doing. And he's able to use that power not only in front of the net, but to go through the neutral zone with purpose. Like, when I watch highlights of him, like, he doesn't have the puck on his stick and he's like, hmm, I wonder like where I'm going to go here. Let's see how things shake out. He's like, I'm going north and I'm going north full speed. And if anyone wants to try to stop me, look out. And that's what he's able to do in the queue, which we we kind of mentioned before is is often a much more skilled league with smaller players. So when you're six foot three, over 200 pounds, you're able to just go right through all those defensemen and he's got a good motor and he plays with pace that's what I like about him and what he lacks in offensive ability we mentioned he he's not exactly a big scorer until his third year in the queue he makes up for with hard work like this guy he he drives hard to the net he battles hard for loose pucks and he's able to make good solid simple plays and sometimes that's what you need out of your centerman. You, you can't get, make it too fancy. You just have to do the right play over and over, and eventually it's going to work out for you. Yeah, 100%. I was reading a really interesting article about uh, Gaucher by David St. Louis from Elite Prospects, and um, it, it looks like he his most common line mate, this guy James Malatesta, not a great pastor. Very trigger-happy yep. player, okay. which was really making it difficult for him to help create, like, sustained offense in in the uh in the offensive zone because he's just kind of 
being forced to chase rebounds instead because Malatesta just shoots at all times. Now, his head coach and general manager in Quebec is Patrick Waugh, and he praised the defensive reliability of his game, saying that he could use him in all situations. And back to that article from David St. Louis, I mean, the title says it all. Nathan Gaucher is definitely an NHLer. Now, say what you want about what that means for his upside, but one could easily picture him playing the same style that he plays right now in the NHL. So a really translatable game in terms of projection. Now, the key is, are you going to be Freddie Gauthier, who gets picked because you have that safe projection? Your big centerman, defensively reliable, but then you can't keep up at the NHL level. I don't think that's going to be a problem because he does play, as you mentioned, with a ton of pace, yeah. ton of speed. So for me, it kind of starts as a third-line center seal, uh, floor, but does he have that extra playmaking ability that can put him in a top six role at the NHL level. That's what NHL scouts are going to have to decide. Yeah, and that's kind of what I I picked up on as well, Ross, from scouts' kind of conclusions at the end of their reports is, yeah, he's probably going to play in the NHL. He already has a lot of good tools that will make him a good centerman. He's very responsible in a defensive role. He's going to be your top guy on a PK unit because he's going to work hard. He's going to outmuscle guys. He's going to have that pace and purpose to get the puck out of the zone. I like he's a blue collar hockey player. That's what just screams out to me, Ross. He makes smart, simple plays. He's not going to wow you. Like coaches and scouts are going to love him, but I don't think fans are uh, going to be jumping out of their seats too often from highlight <laughs> real plays or anything, which is fine. You need guys like that. You can't have everybody uh, just deacon like crazy and trying to make these highlight real plays because eventually that's that's junior hockey type play, and that's not going to that's not going to fly in the NHL or even the AHL or any kind of pro league for that matter. So I think you you mentioned uh, Freddie Gauthier as uh, kind of a comparable. That's probably on the low side there, Ross. I think at, at best. I kind of compared him to a Philip Deneau type guy, right? Like someone sure. that, sure, maybe you're looking at the goal totals and you're seeing that he's playing 18 to 20 minutes a night and you're like, this guy had one goal on the way to a Stanley Cup Finals, 22 games played, one goal, and he's playing all the time. What's going on here? Okay, look at his Corsi numbers. Look at who he's shutting down. He's going up against always the top centerman yeah. in those series. So I think there's a lot of value. And then look, Philip Deneau, when he found a home in LA where they're able to use him better than Montreal, he put up big numbers because he's just put in the right spots with the right players. So I really think that's a possibility for uh, for Goche here if he gets in the right uh, system. Corey Prodman, who had him ranked 23rd, compared him to Adam Lowry. A similar okay, reasoning yeah. behind it, right? Yeah. Third line center, lots of grit, matchup guy, above average NHL compete level. Now, again, it's his hockey sense where it's like, okay, is he a top six guy? But at this stage in the draft, like late first round, if you're saying this guy is definitely going to play games in the National Hockey League and a lot, like establish himself as a top 12 forward, no matter what, I think you probably say, okay, if there's some upside there, like a big kid, 6'3". Now, he's also one of the oldest players in the draft as well, as we kind of referenced by saying he was drafted into the queue yeah, He's a got year three earlier. years of junior. That's very rare for... we Have we had a single prospect, Ross, that is three years in junior? I can't think of one. No, I don't think so. Maybe yeah. maybe the Western League kids, but those guys only play like a, a couple games. This guy's played like every game every year. Yeah. So lots of experience under his belt, and you know players... Uh, right shot, it's more prevalent on D, but you also see it a little bit with forwards. It's a little, little more rare to have a right shot. So uh, I think the, he's got a nice mix. He's obviously been a leader on Quebec. They've given him the A this year. Uh, November 6, 2003, birthday. So going to be 19 next November. Um, you got to think he's got a shot here at the uh, Canadian World Junior Team, maybe even this summer, but definitely next winter. And you can see the numbers there, nine points in 12 playoff games as well and plus 30 rating 74 penalty minutes like he mixes it up he's in the mix for everything and I really like him as a player the offensive numbers you could see were a little more prevalent early on when he was uh when he was in minor hockey but I I'm pretty high on this kid I'm gonna give him four stars uh for me I think that he's gonna be a solid NHL contributor now would I like the Senators to pick him at seven hell no but <laughs> at the same time if he's available at 39 or if there's a situation where the Sens trade down to 25 or below, I would be very comfortable. Hmm? Isn't that trading up? 
ah, I guess you could get semantics in there because okay. you're trading you're trading down the draft board because they start at one. Right. So you're trading down. Okay. But it's up because it's a higher number. <laughs> we gotta we gotta get that straightened out. Good luck, Pillsy. How many stars for you? Yeah. So basically, my stars are are based on the fact that I don't think he's gonna be available at seven or at thirty nine. Like that's such a he's definitely going in the middle in my mind. So unless the Sens traded to a different number <laughs> um, earlier in the draft, we'll go with that. They're, they're probably not going to get him. So I put him at three and a half stars just because he's got good size and good work ethic. And like, if you got those two, that can take you a long way in a professional hockey career. Like if you just focus on, I'm, I'm a guy with good size, I'm going to use that power and strength to my advantage, and I'm going to work my ass off. You can go far with that. So I, I really like uh, Gauthier and I think he's going to be a great player. The only reason I don't have him at four stars is I don't see a scenario where the Sens can put themselves in a place to select him. And Montreal is going to take him at 26 if he's on the board. Honestly, probably. Yeah. So, Because you know, at number one, they've got to take Shane Wright or even Slavkovsky, one of the like top end guys. You know that in front of the home crowd, they're going to at some point take a French player in the draft. Probably more than one. They they have to otherwise the it'll be pandemonium if they don't select a, a high French player that's for sure. Oh yeah, and I mean this wouldn't be a bad pick. This wouldn't be a courtesy nope. pick at all at that range. I think Agreed. that he'd be a super solid player. Just a couple notes that I had on Gauthier as well from uh, from elite prospects. He's great at tipping the puck in front. Also has good board play. Great in transition and has good pace. And for the size, that means skating is not an issue. Yep. Safe projection with a whole not a whole lot of upside, which is what we're kind of talking about there. And then 171 shots on goal, 31 goals. I mean, the percentage, say what you want about it. But I think that uh, that I think his offensive numbers are going to explode next year as a veteran of the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. So I got four stars. Pilsy has three and a half. But realistically, unless the Senators trade where they're at, Probably not going to be Nathan Gauthier. All right, Pilsy, back to the countdown we go after a quick word from our friends at Bet Online. Bet Online is the number one sports book for the Locked On Podcast Network and for great reason as well. They've got all the latest odds, totals, player performance props, and you can even bet on where fired coaches are going to land. Bet Online just actually put out all of the coaching candidates for. The Blackhawks, the Bruins, the Flyers, the Golden Knights, the Jets, the Red Wings, and Stars. That's how many we got right now. The next Stars head coach, the favorite, is Mark Savard. Like, there's some crazy names. The next Red Wings head coach, the favorite, is Sergei Fedorov. So go check out all the lines right now at betonline.net. Check them out for free on your mobile device or your browser. And all you got to do is go say that Locked On sent you. Check them out right now, betonline.net. It's where the game starts. All right, Pilsy, here we go. It's countdown season. Coming in at 25th overall on the Locked On Senators. Draft ranking countdown. We're going to the Czech Republic. Yuri Kulik, a centerman. Kulik is very intriguing, Ross. Like, this guy, like... He had his coming out party in international play, like, and, and we'll get into that. But just just starting off, he's he's doesn't have the size that uh, Gauthier has, that's for sure. But I wouldn't say he's a small guy. I got him listed at six six feet, one hundred seventy two pounds, a left shot centerman playing in the uh, Czechia. I gotta I gotta get used Czechia. to saying Czechia, Czechia. new uh, country name um, in the pro league there. So. He had 49 games played, nine goals, five assists, good for 14 points, four PIMs, and he was the captain of the Czechia U18 team. Yeah, not only that, but he lit it up. He was the MVP at the under-18s this year, and for great reason. That's where the offensive game really exploded for Kulik because we knew that he had defensive skill. We knew that he was one of those reliable centermen who can kill penalties, play in all situations, pretty similar to Nathan Gauthier. But then he decided to wow everyone with nine goals and 11 points Whew. at the World Under-18s. Yes, nine goals in six games. That's pretty sick right there. And he did it in part with a hat trick against Team Canada yeah. in a 6-5 win. Had 11 shots on goal that game. 
So it's not like he did it all against Switzerland, although he had two goals <laughs> and an assist against Switzerland in that game and two goals against Germany as well. But he was just an absolute legend in that tournament, like running up and down. And I, I just love the way he brought it. And you know what else I love too um, is after his season ended on March 14th in the Czech Extra League, he went back down to the U-20 level, maybe in preparation for the World Under-18s or maybe just because there wasn't enough. Um, there, there, why not get him to play a few extra yeah. games? And what did he do down there, Pilsy? He absolutely lit it up. In his second game, he had four points. And then he had a three-point performance, a couple other games with a goal. So all in all, he played six games down there. And yeah, he scored six goals as well. So this guy, I think there's a level of untapped offensive potential for a guy who's really being touted as a very defensively responsible guy. The rankings reflect that. Corey Pronman has him at 17th on his list. Tony Ferrari has him at 18. We've got Scott Wheeler at 22. Elite Prospects at 28. Craig Button at 32. Bob McKenzie at 40. And Chris Peters at 49. Chris Peters, his list is going to be updated and, and he's going to fly up the rankings just like he did on Scott Wheeler's most recent rankings. He was all the way down at 41 and he moved up to 22. That's the kind of impact that the world under 18s made on Yuri Coolidge. So I think that you're just looking at a guy who's scratching the surface. And I don't even think he's that far away. This guy could be in the NHL to me in two, maybe three years. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised, Ross. And that's the thing. He's a smart two-way center. You mentioned how defensively responsible he is, but then he can go out and just be a dominant force on offense whenever he wants to be. Like if he decides, all right, I'm going to ramp things up offensively, he can do that. And one of the reasons he can do that is he has a lethal one-timer on the power play. Like some of the highlights to watch from that tournament, like it's it's like the Norris um, situation on Ottawa. Yeah. Everyone knows that's watching on TV, the other team, the Ottawa Senators, the fans in the building, the broadcasters, every single person watching this game of hockey knows it's going to him. You still can't stop him. And they're still going to feed him because they know that's the best option. And Coolish just does such a great job of that. And there's lots to like uh, defensively as well. Like he's able to drive attackers wide. Like Will Scouch uh, in his uh, video that he did about him said he does a good job of just hurting attackers where he wants them to go like a border collie with sheep right it's like <laughs> no, no 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 you don't want to go towards that gate let's head uh, towards this gate over here in this field over here let's go wide instead of going to the home plate danger scoring uh, area of the ice so that's one thing that he uses his hockey iq to just make smart decisions that make opponents lives very hard however Sometimes he gets out muscle for puck battles, and that'll happen. He's a younger kid playing in a pro league over in Czechia. And he's not... Uh, Will Scouch also mentioned that his team had a hard time getting to high danger scoring opportunities and getting good shot attempts off. So that's going to limit his uh, chances as well. So I think part of the the reason uh, scouts are... Some scouts are have different opinions about Coolidge is... It's, it's tough to evaluate him at the, the Czech pro level and international hockey compared to the usual uh, SHL or juniors or college hockey or something like that. Like, I think it's harder to get a read on where a guy truly is there. I'm trying to think of a comparable over the last few years, a guy who's been drafted in the first round out of the Czech league and nothing's really coming to mind. Like I, I'm trying to think over the last few years when we've been doing this, like we, we know Jan, Jan Mishak was a Czech player, but he was playing out, in, in the Ontario Hockey League a little bit, or w did he come over after? Uh, I don't remember, but I think he was in the OHL. Mm, yeah, anyways, that's neither here nor there. I guess the, the point being is that it's hard to tell when they're not playing against the same level of opponents. Yeah, he was drafted that's out of the I'm Hamilton saying. Bulldogs yeah. as well. So, But that's, that's why he shot up all these rankings, right? When you see him play against his own level of competition. Martin Kout is the last one. Uh, okay, that I, I can thought see about here. him, yeah. Part, part of Beast uh, in the Chechia League. That was from the 2018 draft. He went 20th overall. I think you're probably looking at a little more upside uh, from Kulik. Now, Kout came over and, and ended up playing the AHL really young. And I wonder if that's always good for their development or not. Obviously, fans love it because they're in the system. They're close by. They're playing with other teams' prospects. But 
But he, he went, wonder, that's a Detroit pick, right? No, Colorado. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Because I was going to say, if it's Detroit, you have to go through Grand Rapids University to get to yeah, Detroit. No, no <laughs> doubt. Yeah, all that to say, man, I, I think that he would be a phenomenal pick in this range, even a little bit higher. Like, I think that next year you're going to see the offensive numbers pop. You even saw it at the end of the year. He was starting to contribute. Um, as well, pull up his uh, Elite Prospects page here, and I know it does count the uh the world under 18s in here but 13 goals in his last 10 games bill see like that's pretty pretty decent um when you're when you're looking at what he brings april 14th birthday so he'll be 18 throughout this entire playing season 5 11 179 we have him at now after the uh the nhl combined and when you look at the points again this guy's played in a million different leagues with Karlovi here with the uh the check squad i love that he's getting a ton of games though right 49 yep. games this year a lot of these other guys in Sweden and whatnot are playing like 25 to 30, right? So I think that that in itself is is something that you can be like, okay, so he's getting lots of development time. That's great. Let's see that continue next year. And, and in one spot too, right? Last year, he was back and forth on loan with the second division team, playing eight games, 10 games, and then five games, point per game at the U20 level. So I, I'm excited about this prospect. I think that he's going to get scooped up well before the second round. I think he could be one of those like really late risers on draft day where a team could even take him in the top 15 and be like, we are banking on the offensive upside because his vision on the defensive side, like the way he controls play in the defensive end, like his skating, his, his, uh, his defensive positioning is all so well refined that if he can unlock the offensive game at the next level, like he's already unlocked it against where he's playing against, especially late in the year. How high is his ceiling? I think the answer is extremely high for Yuri Kulik. Yeah, Ross, you know who's coming to mind as we're having this discussion about Kulik? A guy that I found we had similar discussions about in um, previous drafts, Anton Lundell. Like Lundell, when we talked about him as a prospect, it was all, this guy is defense first. He's going to be a great third line center. He's going to kill penalties. Um, Maybe, hopefully, he can get some offense going, right? And He's been able to do that in his first year with the Florida Panthers. He had 18 goals, 26 assists. He had 44 points in 65 games. Like That's the type of production that if he's put in the right spot and is drafted by a good team and that can surround him by good veteran players like Florida was able to with Lundell, I think uh, Kula could really flourish. So I think there's a lot of upside to be had here. I think one, a team is going to reach and grab him earlier rather than later. And I think they're going to be happy they did that. I think he's going to be a, a really good player. Yeah, I think that's a... Uh, I mean, I know you kind of put in the sense potential of being available at that spot in your stars. I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to give him four and a half stars just okay. based on... He's an unbelievable player, and I'd like to see him in Ottawa. It's as simple as that. So, are, would you like? Is that the kind of pick where you're like, screw the value that I that I have in other draft picks and prospects no. and stuff? Use that value to trade up to grab him, uh, and that's our big splash of the draft. Mm, like, is he that? Like, you got him at four and a half stars. Like, that's yeah. that's pretty damn near perfect. So, I mean, I wouldn't do okay I wouldn't do that? that with I wouldn't do that with Lane Hudson who had five stars. But for me, that's just like if he's available at thirty nine, like jump on that. However, there was a time in the middle of the season where he wasn't as productive. So maybe you're thinking like, was that just mid season blues? It was after the World Juniors got canceled, where there was a little bit of a lull in in his uh, in his game, but. I'm not worried about that. I'm banking on the well-rounded play, the pace, the amazing footwork on defense. And I would say that if it's like, all right, trade 39 and and one of your two third round picks to move up into the top 25, I would absolutely do that. But I'm not making an enormous splash. There are some guys who I like better, but I, I'll tell you right now, I'll take this guy over the two that we're doing tomorrow. All right. I, so I've got him at th- three stars, not because I don't like him as a player, just because I don't see a scenario where the Sens will draft him. And I just think he's going to get scooped up earlier. I, th- I think he's a great player and he's going to have a uh, good impact, but I don't see the fit working for the Sens. Okay. So you get three stars, not even three and a half? There, unless, like, how do you move up from 39 to, I think it, it, he's his range is going to be like 15 to 25. Like, how do you move from 39 up my my math isn't working out here, but how do you like to move that many picks 
is a big deal. You'd have to put a lot of chips in the table unless you're you're fl- you're flopping multiple picks. Like later on, the the Sens give up another earlier pick and take another one back. Like it's just so hard to maneuver that. So that's why I, I give him three stars. Not because I don't like him as a player. I just don't see how it would happen. And and that's again, like like you said, that's how I'm kind of grading my uh, stars as well. Yeah, I just absolutely think he's going to he's gonna make an impact sooner than a lot of these players, too. I don't think he's far away from being an impact That's player fair. at the NHL level. Yep. So let's see how this all plays out because, for me, Yuri Kulich, and if you're listening to this after your team has just selected him, yep. this is one of those players, I think, when we look back in the draft, he's going to be climbing up uh, when we go like, wait, how'd he go 20th? Like, this guy's an absolute stud. So pilsy has got him at three stars. I got him at four and a half. And that's it for Yuri Kulik. All right, Pilsy, wrapping up a quick word on the Stanley Cup playoffs. The Tampa Bay Lightning tying up their series with the New York Rangers last night. You think this one's going seven games now on its way back to to Madison Square Garden? I think so. Like, there's just too many... Like, these teams are very evenly matched. Like, and when you have two world-class goaltenders going head-to-head in a conference final where, like, there's so much on the line... I don't see either either team running away with this one. Like even when the Rangers were up two nothing, Ross, I was like, this is not even close to being over. <laughs> I know. I'm so upset that I didn't hammer the Lightning series line when they were down two nothing because I already have yeah. futures riding on the Rangers. I really should have hedged before it was too late. And man, Patty Maroon, of course he does. Uh, scores oh to God. open the scoring. You know he's playing in like his 148th playoff game. Yeah, I was trying to think, like, when's the last time Maroon lost a playoff series? I can tell you right now, Pat Maroon. It would have been with the Oilers, right? Up against San Jose. 2018? I mean. That's my guess. Your guess is is what, sorry? When he was with the Oilers, uh, and didn't they lose to San Jose in the second round in 2018? No, he was... He was with New Jersey. But they didn't that, make the playoffs with him, did they? They lost to the Tampa Bay Lightning. Oh, wow. In five games, interestingly enough. And guess what? He scored the last goal of that playoff run for the Devils. Wow, of course he did. So he's so he's going on his 14th straight series win? Yeah, it, yeah he's won 14 straight series. Wow. Uh, he is a he is a modern day dynasty. Yeah, yeah. They were they were saying on the broadcast that uh, he's the the only player to have played in this many series since the Islanders. Like no, like yeah. nobody since the Islanders won four straight have done it. His next game will be his ninetieth playoff game since he's been eliminated. Wow. Unbelievable! Oh my god. Nine goals, 12 assists, 21 points in 89 games, 93 penalty minutes. This guy is unbelievable. So are both the goalies. Like That was just a great goalie battle last night. Both were fantastic. And What was strange to me is right after that fight between Vetrano and uh, Brandon Hagel, great tilt. Dude. Playoff yeah. tilts just have that extra something there's on top. Hate behind there's it. so much hate and so much passion. Yeah. They were beacon in the box after. It was just awesome to see. But uh, right after that, I get a text from my buddy Wes. He goes, hammer the Rangers right now. You know, they just needed that that change in momentum. And as bet online hit that, like, check mark, it's like the bet successful, Kucherov break away. Uh. Like, back to the net. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Thanks Oops. for coming out. Speaking of the lightning, we just talked about Yuri Kulich. This one to me was a little strange, but Corey Pronman's player comparable for Kulich was uh, Ross Colton. Yeah, I did see that. That was that's but, not what I would have expected. But he's opening up an offensive can of worms in his game, though. Ross Colton. That, I mean, he didn't he score the Stanley Cup Clincher. winning goal? Yeah, so that's Easy. not bad. <laughs> no, not bad at all. Uh, meanwhile, we're gonna have the rest versus Russ debate with the Colorado Avalanche, aren't we? Because now they're going on already five days sitting, and this series looks like there's no end in sight. In yeah, East. I I don't I don't think so at all. There's. Uh, or Colorado's gonna be waiting a while, and the issue with that is that's not gonna help them get Kadri back. Like I don't, I you think don't think Kadri's so? Done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he replied. Do you see that? He replied to a TSN Instagram post that said, "Oh that no, I didn't like, see." Yeah. So he said that the post said Kadri likely done for the playoffs. Yeah. And he replied. He said, "Yeah, we'll see." Dot dot dot. I mean, fair. That's that's what you want him to say, but 
I don't is know. Is it realistic? Yeah, and that sucks for Kadri because this is a contract year for him, is it not? Oh, yeah, but he's already earned his next deal. Definitely, but if you could add a cherry on top, having a massive uh, part in a Stanley Cup final, that adds a couple shekels yeah. to your contract yeah. deal. I mean, you added finals in there, which I can't argue, but I'd say he's still upped his value based on his play this postseason. Definitely. Being a pass, not getting suspended. Like <laughs> yeah, known. congrats on not getting suspended. Honestly, it's easier said than done, though, when it's happened three years in the playoffs. Yeah, self sabotage with the Leafs. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give Kadri a little fist bump for that. I absolutely love to see it. But hey, we saw this firsthand in 2007. Pillsy, like the Ottawa Senators dominated the Eastern Conference, took them 15 games, one loss each series. Bang, yep. bingo, then bango, then bongo, and then. You had the Anaheim Ducks going to a seven-game series with the Detroit Red Wings, and Ottawa was just picking their nose, listening to belly rap about uh, about you might. <laughs> but that uh, was wait. an insane amount of rest. Like, wasn't it like, for some reason, I want to say it was like seventeen days or something. Oh, I can I can actually find out. I'm going to Christoph Schubert talkie reference because I was going to go to Alfie, but it's like, wait, he played a bunch of playoff games after that. I want to say Shuby would be pretty close here. Yeah, here we go. Um, Nine. Nine days. Oh, I thought it was more than that for some reason. But I mean, that's still a long time. Nine days. I don't know. 17 days. That would have been wild. Holy crap. Yeah, 17 days is like a full series. (laughs) But even still, man. And then they had to go out there and start on the road in Anaheim. And it was just a gong show all around. But... That's neither here. Nor so, there. so uh, well, let, let's let's debate it then. Embrace debate. Is that yeah. the rust versus rest gonna happen to Colorado? Rust, rust. You you can't I mimic agree. the hate and passion and and intensity of a Stanley Cup playoff game unless you're in it. Does Colorado have home ice advantage no matter what? Yes. Yeah, I think so. They're the Rather, number one team in the West. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. So so I guess their their rest or I guess their mitigating factor, kind of the even up, is the altitude that the that's other teams can have gonna to come to. Yeah, and, and and especially if it's like only a one day break in between the end of the Eastern Conference series and then the Stanley Cup final starting, because then you don't get to fly there and get used to it. No, that's not the case. So I guess they would have had to have rested anyways, but again, it would have been more on the same page. I am under the impression that the Stanley Cup finals are not going to begin until June 15th or oh, June after 18th. NBA. They're waiting for the NBA to finish because that's ESPN, smart. TNT. Yeah, I don't mind it as well, but at the same time, like that's going to be a long time in between games. Like I feel bad for the Black Aces because if I'm Jared Bednar, I'm making them go head to head, full intensity scrimmage. I mean, again, you can't replicate it, but you need these guys to be full out practicing and and ready for the competition or else first 10 minutes like i'm hammering the over in game one of the stanley cup finals because i think it's going to be a bit of chaos with both teams having a few extra days off definitely and here's another debate if camp kemper's healthy do you go back to kemper or do you just stick with francis who's been great i don't know that's a tough question one that jared bednar and i'm sure the goalie coach in colorado are are that they're going to be going through and we'll discuss that later because we got to get out of here we already got some draft prospects there (laughs) let us know claude Giroux. guys i think the dream's dead but we will continue we will continue to hope yeah i think the dream's dead no not not dead there's still 35 percent chance alive for us let's go it's it's down it's down it's down to like 15 now for me unfortunately yeah, we'll see over. though yeah we'll see we'll see i'll certainly be thrilled if it happens but i'm not ready to get hurt again on this topic i'm not ready to get hurt but uh, let us know what you think whether you believe claude drew will be will be coming to the nation's capital for more than his summer vacation but for today we say goodbye for brandon pillar i'm ross levitan this has been the locked on senators podcast your team every day <laughs>